Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. What's up? Uh, and we are we are just going to get into it today. Oh, dang. Going mm-hmm. right for it. We're going right for it. Okay. A uh, very cool Demon Knight baseball team, uh, or yeah, baseball T, T. T, there we go, in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Uh, store at badmagicproductions.com uh, for any customer service questions you might have. I love that we have a sweet little baseball tee in there now. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. Uh, this month, if you missed it, we donated 20% of our Patreon subscriptions to the Riggins Idaho EMTs. Mm-hmm. Able to cut them a check for $11,600. Going to go a long ways to keep their equipment up to date and running. Good job. So go to facebook.com slash Riggins Ambulance if you would like to you know learn more or donate yourself. Very nice. And I hear you have more stories than normal today, Lindsay Lou. Yes. I mean, it's just getting so hard to pick and choose and to have the right amount. So, yep, three stories, my friend. Any details or just a surprise? Hmm. Surprise. 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 Uh, I have two. Going to get outdoorsy with both of them. Oh. Oh. Mm-hmm. Heading, okay. heading underground uh, for the first ones, traveling to Australia's hmm. uh, Janolan Cave Complex. I want to go to Australia so mm-hmm. bad. Me too. I know it's not real, but... Right. No, one, no, no one lives there. It's no not real. Right. It's a conspiracy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and in the second, no specific location given other than somewhere up in the mountains for some search and rescue missions gone really wrong. Uh, so it feels like it's uh, set in America. It'll uh, make sense when I tell the story. It's probably set in Kellogg. It's true. It's probably set in here just outside of Coeur d'Alene. Probably. You guys are probably going to get screwed today when you go skiing. Oh, boy. Yep. You're going down. I <laughs> uh, hope it creeps you out as much as it creeped me out. Um, are you are you ready for the first tale? What, what I, are your socks? My are, socks. Are you dressed my, up today? Am I dressed up? With your, what, what do with I your, wear? Costumes? With your scared to death socks. <laughs> I have I have on these fabulous. Oh, one, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, giant, yummy, fuzzy socks. Nice. Very friend. timely. Yes, because I'm Wonder Woman. Because of the new movie. I know, 1984. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, these come from fan Victoria Peacock. Thanks, Victoria. Also, I'm going to try something new this week. Can you okay? work one of your flags out? Mm-hmm. Nope. Nope. Can you guys see it? No, I don't want to do this because no one wants to hear that. True, true. So I'm going to try and do For this. Our, okay, good. Nope. Yeah. Nope. For our audio only list, uh, uh, you know, fans for Creeps and Peepers probably don't want to hear what you just did. Yeah, that was me waving the flag very close to the microphone <laughs> and it sucks. <laughs> Um, okay, so decent amount of setup. Okay, great. I'll get cozy. Yeah, while well, you get cozy. Uh, and, and I'm going to show pictures at the end, of course. If you're new, these pictures will be uh, on our socials, Facebook and Instagram, at Scared to Death Podcasts. And these first pictures, outside of scares, just really, really cool. Uh, Australia's Janolan Cave Complex, found in the Janolan Karst Conservation Reserve in New South Wales, one of the most beautiful and mysterious cave systems in the whole world. Uh, Janolan is an aboriginal term that means high mountain. And of course, since I'm talking about it here, the Janolan cave complex is vast uh, and also supposedly haunted. Just a huge system of underground tunnels, pools, and caverns. Local tribes once knew the caves as Benomia, or the dark places. They feared and shunned them. Uh, while one tribal group, the Gudungara people, did come to believe that the cave system's subterranean water had curative powers and they would bring their sick to bathe in them, even they refused to venture past the supposedly healing waters found just inside some of the complex's entrances. Uh, To go further was forbidden. The rest of the darkness terrified them. They believed that evil things lurked out in the shadows. The first Europeans to discover the caves were brothers, James and Charles Whalen, who first stumbled upon one of the system's caves in 1838. James found the caves while in pursuit of another James, an ex-convict, an active local thief named James McCown, who had stolen livestock, tools, clothing, and a flower grinder. (laughs) So random. (laughs) Very old-timey theft. Uh, Wayland tracked him to one of the caverns, which may have been his hideout. He then quickly reported his discovery to his brother Charles, who returned with his brother to further explore it. And the brothers continued to investigate the caves, and soon in the 1840s, they were hosting public tours. 
Then in 1866, the caves were placed under the control of the New South Wales government, becoming only the second area in the entire world reserved for the purpose of conservation. And thousands of visitors a year have enjoyed the beauty and mystery of this system ever since, and some have claimed to encounter, of course, more than just natural beauty. Uh, the system's incredibly vast. There are at least 25 miles of tunnels. Wow. Yeah, multi-level passages, uh, huge caverns, over 300 entrances that are known. So much may still be unknown. Uh, roughly 100 different named caves, like Skeleton Cave, the Devil's Coach House. Hell no. And the Bottomless Pit. But why? Why would you go to any <laughs> of those places? And paranormal encounters have been reported in taking place in almost all of these caves. Time now for the tales of Janolin's ghosts. Jeff Melbourne, perfect Australian name, a uh -huh. uh, longtime cave guide, with a <laughs> uh, shared his best ghost story with an interviewer a few years ago. Jeff said, "About a year ago, I was taking a group of visitors through the river cave at Janolin. It was a regular tour, not one of our ghost tours. The path runs alongside the pool of reflections, one of the main features of the cave. I was leaning over the railing, looking into the crystal clear water." and I saw something on the bottom. A bloke standing next to me said, it's a button. Without looking up, I said, you think so? And he said, it's a button off an old tunic. There's another one over there. I still didn't look at him. After peering into the water for a few more moments, I started moving the group on, but then there was no one standing right next to me. The closest guy was several meters away, and he called out, what happened to that guy in between us? I said, what did he look like? He said he was a tall man wearing a rumpled gray suit, but there was no sign of this man. At the end of the tour, Jeff then asked everyone in his group if any of them had seen a button in the water, if any man had spoken to them about a button, etc. No one seemed to know what he was talking about. Apparently, he had been talking to a ghost. That is what he truly believes. Uh, prior to working at Janolan Caves, Jeff worked for the Commonwealth Bank for 32 years with supervisory and management roles and customer service and IT, and he claims that he never believed in ghosts prior to this incident and other incidents he has had since. Now he insists he's had numerous unexplained experiences. The week after a ghost apparently pointed out some buttons in the water to him, after leading another tour to the same spot, a member of his group suddenly told him that he was glad they'd moved on from the exact same spot where Jeff had had that previous encounter. When asked why, the man told Jeff that in the shadows, he had seen someone sitting on a rock watching their group. Jeff asked what the person looked like, and he was told, an old man in a suit. Unless an old man in a suit had somehow snuck into this portion of the caves without a guide, which was against the rules and highly unlikely, Jeff doesn't know what this man could have seen if not a ghost. Likely the same ghost who had spoken with him the week before. Jeff speculates that this apparition is the ghost of James Wilbird, Yet another James. Uh, this James worked at Janolan for almost 50 years. In life, he extensively explored the caves. Maybe he's still exploring. He discovered the river cave where his spirit may have been seen and the pool of Cerebus, Temple of Baal Cave, Orient Cave, and Ribbon Cave. And it's believed that his ashes were buried in an, ex in an inaccessible crevice deep in one of the many labyrinths inside the complex to which he devoted his life. Do these ashes somehow now tie him to this place? Since Mr. Wilbert's death in 1942, numerous guides and visitors alike have claimed to have experienced fleeting glimpses of him. Some have even claimed to have felt James. These guides, while underground, have been tapped on their shoulder only to look around and find no one there within tapping distance. Ah. Various visitors have witnessed a tall, thin old man on their tour, sporting a big mustache and a dark suit, a man they didn't remember seeing when their tour began. Later, when they get uh, go to look at him again, he's nowhere to be found. And then they find out time and time again that no man fitting that description was ever on the tour with them. And the spirit of James Wilbur, one of many, believed to haunt the caves. Uh, one evening, another cave guide was taking a small family through the Orient Cave when it was very quiet. They were in a chamber known as the Well, looking up at the natural dome far above them. The guide was describing their surroundings when he and his tour suddenly heard a loud piercing scream, making them all jump. It came from the chamber they had just left. A man on the tour asked, what was that noise? And before answering, the guide asked, what did you hear? The man said, sounded like a woman screaming. And the guide agreed that was what he had heard as well. The man's children on the tour who'd heard the scream also then started to cry and they all decided to leave the cave without finishing the tour. Why didn't the guide go back and make sure some woman wasn't in trouble? Because apparently he was absolutely certain 
There was no one else in this cave system with them. They had just been in the chamber from which the sound came as well. And it would have been virtually impossible for a visitor to sneak past them, sneak past some other staff to access the area from which the scream originated. In addition to this screaming woman, who other vis visitors have also claimed to hear, the spirits of children, or of entities pretending to be children, may also exist in the caves. Nope. <laughs> the Jubilee Cave is currently closed for tours, but a few years ago, an anonymous cave guide was taking a group of adults through it. A big chamber called the Water Cavern marks the furthest reaches of the Jubilee, where tour groups always turn around to go back. And the group that day had stopped there to photograph some unusual chocolate-colored stalactites and gaze into the enormous cavern before turning around to return the way they came. And while they took photos, the guide clearly heard the noise of a group of small children giggling and laughing. Uh -uh. He quickly asked his group, did you hear that? And when they all agreed that they indeed did, the group could not leave the caves quickly enough. Whatever they heard, they all knew it was not actual children, not living children anyway. The spirits of children have also been heard in the nearby cave's house, just a six minute walk from the nearest cave entrance. Construction on the first incarnation of cave's house began back in 1879, built by Jeremiah Wilson, a local farmer appointed the keeper of the caves in 1867. He erected a single story wooden building roofed with corrugated iron, and this first cave's house contained just five bedrooms and a large dining room. In 1887, Wilson expanded, erecting a two-story wooden building that can now hold 30 visitors, a structure characterized by deep verandas around three sides of both levels. Then in 1890, Wilson demolished the original small kitchen and in his place he erected a two-story wooden building alongside the original main building, built in the same style as that 1887 building. And then in 1896, a great fire destroyed much of the cave's house. Over the next two decades, buildings were repaired and expanded into a complex where over a hundred guests could now stay at a time, and thousands and thousands have now stayed at this historical site, recently added to the New South Wales Historical Register. Today, Caves House operates as it has for over a century, as a hotel with a cafe, bar, function rooms, and a restaurant, and as a reportedly very haunted dwelling. I Caves, knew it. <laughs> Caves House staff have repeatedly reported that at night they hear children loudly running up and down the hallway in the Vernon Wing, the oldest remaining section of Caves House built in 1897. The Vernon Wing is currently where staff stay and the noise is loud enough to keep staff awake at night, but no children are ever seen. The apparition of a woman has been seen though. In March, 2014, this cave guide, uh, Jeff Molesworth, almost nothing but James and Jeff's in these tales apparently, uh, was conducting a ghost tour in the mud tunnels near the river cave when the discussion of spectral belief came up. One of the visitors asked him whether or not he truly believed the caves were haunted or it was just if it was just a way to bring in tourists. And at that moment, a lady decided to share her story of what had happened to her in Cave's house just the night before. She said she was staying in room 211. And she said that to her horror, she clearly saw a ghostly arm come through the door of her room, no body, nothing more than just an arm wearing a lacy cuff. Yeah. Plainly visible for several moments before vanishing. So strange. Three members of a family who stayed in Cave's house roughly two decades ago uh, recently shared another strange experience. They'd visited Gentlin when their two daughters, or with their two daughters, uh, when they were young, over 20 years ago, and they stayed in a room on the second floor. And during their stay, the two girls pestered their mother to take them up to the third floor. Their mom insisted there was nothing to see there. It was no different than the second floor, so they never went. Over 15 years later, they all visited Gentlin again and reminisced about their first visit. One of the girls told her sister at this time and, the, and their mother that during their first day, after she had not been allowed to visit the third floor, she had a crazy dream. She dreamed she went up there anyway with her sister and that once there, she and her sister floated around a strange room as if they themselves were ghosts. In this dream, their mother came upstairs, saw the girls, as well as an older lady in a rocking chair. Their mother begged her girls to come down and the lady in the rocking chair calmly told the mother and the girls uh, or that the girls were only playing. A strange dream, like so many strange dreams. And when the daughter first told her sister and mother, that's all she thought it was, a strange dream. But by the end of her story, the color had left her mother and sister's faces. Oh man. As it turns out, they had both also had that exact same dream. No way. And they'd also had it when they stayed at the hotel 15 years earlier. Oh. 
What could have caused that? All three women had the exact same dream on the exact same night. None of them talk about it for 15 years, almost as if they didn't remember it until they returned to the site where they originally had it. Was it only a dream or did it happen? So odd. And now one last supposed encounter. A middle-aged married couple from New Zealand, Jack and Oliver, were taking a tour of some of the Janolan Caves in 2018, and halfway through their tour, they started noticing a strange man following their group. While the rest of the group stayed close together, uh, close together in the days before social distancing, the guide, Jack and Oliver, another married couple, and a family of four, this tenth person, uh, this, or sorry, in a family of four, this tenth person hovered back. Jack saw him first. The second time he noticed him uh, and looked back, Oliver followed his gaze, also saw him. The couple exchanged a glance of recognition, but neither said anything at first. Every time their group stopped for the guide to point out another geographic feature, uh, he'd stop as well, or geological feature, staying 20 to 30 feet behind them. It was always just dark enough for them to not be able to fully make out his features. Just a shadowy, solitary man hanging back and away from the group. This figure creeped both of the men out, but he also never did anything worth mentioning to the tour guide. Then when the tour ended and the group exited the cave, this entity did not exit with them. So Jack talked to the guide, letting him know that one of their group was still inside. At this point, he still thinks this is a guy. The guide quickly looks around, sees that everyone is there that he's responsible for. So now Jack, of course, asks him how many were on the tour. And of course, the guy tells him, you know, one less <laughs> than he thought were, were on this tour. Jack asked him if he'd seen this other man hanging back. He says he hadn't. At this point, Oliver talks to the guide about how he'd also seen this man. The guide then returns into the cave, comes back out a few minutes later, assures Jack and Oliver there's no one else inside, there was oh, no man. one else on his tour. Creeped out, glad to be out of the caves, the two men then walk back to the cave's hotel where they were staying that night. They saw their guide again that evening at the restaurant as they were preparing to head back to their room after finishing their meal. He tells them he'd asked, uh, you know, uh, some uh, another guide doing another tour if they had seen anyone. She tells him that they hadn't and that no one on their tour reported anything out of the ordinary. So they're the only people who have seen this guy. Confused, Jack and Oliver grab a few drinks at the bar, talk mostly about what the hell they might have just witnessed in the cave. They both agree someone had to have snuck in, maybe just avoided detection uh, for the rest of the day with so many tunnels and caverns. There were just so many places to hide. But why would someone follow their tour if they were hiding? After their drinks, the two men retreat to the room. And about 30 minutes after closing their door and settling in, just as they're getting ready to get into bed for the night, they hear a knock at the door. Three quick, quick raps. Jack opens it. No more than a few seconds after hearing these raps, no one's there. Peeks his head on the hallway. No one's there. Oliver asks what's going on. He'd heard it too. Uh, Jack tells him that no one, you know, no one is out there. He doesn't know. Now they have something else to speculate about. How could someone who had just knocked three times disappear so quickly? Where would they? Where would they go? Uh, if they'd run away, they would have heard footsteps. If they would have retreated into another room, they would have heard that room's door shut. As they discuss these possibilities, there's another knock at the door. Three knocks, just like the first time. This time, Oliver goes with Jack to the door. Neither man opens it straight away. Who is it? Oliver calls out. He receives no answer. Jack looks through the peephole, sees no one. They stand there quietly for a few moments, maybe even a full minute or two, waiting for the knock to return. After not hearing anything, no footsteps, nothing, they turn to return to their bed, and they hear a third sequence of three knocks. God. Oliver twists around quickly, immediately following the third knock. He is flinging the door open, and now they see someone. <gasps> there he is, the man from the cave. Oh, man. But he is not a man. They both find themselves scared silent, staring at the shape of a man who seems made up of, like, black smoke, swirling and shifting in the shape of some featureless human. Then it raises a shadowy arm, points behind them, points back towards the caves, steps towards them inside their room. Jack loses it. He screams, accidentally knocks Oliver to the ground. He turns to run further back into the room. As he runs, Jack is able to see this shadowy thing start to walk past him, also start to disappear, quickly fading into nothing as he makes it almost to the window, and then that's it. Jack and Oliver throw all their belongings into a suitcase. They're checked out of the hotel within 10 minutes. They drive an hour to the little town of Lithgow, grab a room at the Zigzag uh, Motel, uh, where thankfully nothing happens, and they spend most of the evening talking about what they'd just seen, trying to figure out what the hell had happened. Who or what was that entity? What did it want with Jack and Oliver? And what was it pointing at? The end. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of weird, and there's so many more stories. I tried to like pick uh, the ones that I found the most interesting, but there actually is a ton of like uh, oh, on paranormal boards and Australian stuff. Lots of like quick little snippet encounters. Mm -hmm. You know, just saw a guy for a second, uh, heard a weird noise in this cave, all of our group heard this, uh, all of us staying in the hotel saw this, like on and on and on and on. There's lots of little stories. None of it sounds malicious, though. True. So that's good. True, yeah, none I of it. I mean, I guess. Right, right. Yeah, there's, um, this, none of the staff seem freaked out or anything. Yeah, it feels very benign. Mm-hmm. I uh, mean, weird and would absolutely freak me the fuck out, but I like that no one's like, you know, Oh, you know, his face was disfigured. And, right. You know, he's, I mean, yes, you're scared, but you're scared because of what you don't know. Yeah, most of it seems to be, i um, trying to uh, pull it up here. James uh, or Jeff there or goes. John or Joey yeah, that, or that, one that, of the J's. Mm -hmm, exactly. I know there's three James and a few Jeffs in this story. <laughs> I was so glad you said something because in my mind, I'm like, what is everyone's name begin with a J? <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, the uh, the old man in the suit. Oh, man. Oh, James Wilbert. Yeah, oh, I wrote Wib that down. Wibbard, actually. I kept saying <laughs> Wilbert. My brain kept introducing it. I even double-checked online. I'm like, Wibbard? Like, W-I-B-U-R-D? That's exactly how I wrote it down in my notes. Wilbert? No, Wibbard. Oh, you did right. Yeah. Okay, maybe I said it right the first time. Well, who knows? Or I'm just a genius. <laughs> so I want to show you these pictures. Okay. And a lot of these aren't scary. They're, it just seems like a really cool place. Um, this first one is one of the main wow. entrances. Oh, yeah, and just for... Um, okay, I was going to say, there's no fucking way I'm ever going there, but that is... Beautiful. And, and look at that trail for yeah. scale. You know, there's no one standing on in this picture, but obviously this is a huge entrance yeah. and that forest around it. Um, yeah. So now, okay. So the, in the distance is the way that you would come in. Correct. So correct. This is somebody in inside. Yeah. Okay. And, and this is one of the bigger caverns, I believe. I can't believe how high up it is. <laughs> I like, know. I'm so used to like caves around here or, yeah. you know, like mines and stuff that I've been in. Right. And it's, you know, dark, damp, and low that's to most the ground. of it. Okay. Most of it. This okay. is like a big entrance that then goes down into little tunnels. Okay, uh, and then opens up into more caverns. Like this next one is an entrance to Nettle Cave. This is from 1888. Wow, do caves freak you out? They kind of freak me out. They do. Yeah, I think they freak most people out. Well, I just am waiting for them to fucking collapse and I'm going to die. Oh, there's that too. Yeah, outside of paranormal, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Forget the paranormal. I'm afraid. What's that movie? Like The 33 or something? Those miners? Mm, I never saw it, but yes. <sighs> down in South America, I It'll believe. It'll make you cry. Uh, this next one, some crazy rock formations at the Orient Cave. Mm. I mean, really pretty. And they, and they have um, several of these caves they've had lit up for years now. Uh, you know, as they give tours and stuff. Imagine all the good crystals that are in there. <laughs> I bet the energy there are, in there is so good. There are a lot of crystals. Uh, this next one is um, the original Caves House Hotel. So when it was oh, first built. Oh, okay. In the 19th century. Um, this next one is one of the first tours sometime in the mid to late 1800s. I love the way these people are dressed. I love that there's a photograph of this. What mm -hmm. are the odds? I know. Old timey. Well, it, it is like a, you know, a very documented place, very important yeah. uh, geographical location. <laughs> and I just love that, you know, back then uh, they're, they're going into a cave for some tour, but all the guys have like suits on. I honestly, Most I of them ha have hats. I, I wish that men still wore suits, uh, three piece suits every day. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I hint, hint. <laughs> oh man, one of the things I like about podcasting, not having to wear a suit. Um, this this next one is James Wilbert. So I love this, the way you said that as if you wore a suit in your previous job and you're like, oh, thank God I don't have to wear suits I anymore. love all the jobs I've had that don't have to wear suits. Correct. <laughs> uh, hey, he's so handsome. Yeah, like a, like a dignified older gentleman. Oh, there's an actor he reminds me of that I don't know his name, but I can absolutely picture him. And then this last one, this is a Janolin Caves House Hotel today. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, you know, built into a, a decent... And actually, <laughs> they have nothing to do with this show, but I saw, you know, COVID's hit them like everybody oh, everywhere yeah. else. And if you can get there, there are some amazing deals. Oh. Like, like it's really cheap to stay there right now. And it's it's like a six minute walk. From, the, from this to the cave complex. Oh, this is probably like the equivalent of we were at Machu Picchu, not mm. 2020, but 2019. Mm -hmm. And as you approach the entrance into yeah. Machu Picchu, there is this that one super hotel. glam hotel, like yeah. beyond bougie. Yeah. I remember looking at it being like, I'm sorry, you want to charge me $1,300 a night? I know. I know. Because like, we were like, oh, we should have stayed there. And they were like, how, how much was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? But I remember that, you know, Peru was also... Yeah, I mean, everybody was yeah. hit by COVID, right? And mm -hmm. so our tour guide, who is so amazing, if you ever yeah. find yourself in Peru, this guy was the best. Mm -hmm. um, but he, there was for a long time, you just couldn't, Machu Picchu was open, but right. you know, getting there was a whole ordeal and the deals were pretty 
Yeah. Be pretty great. Well, for our Australian creeps and peepers. Dang, yeah. If you, if you haven't been New here, Zealand? you're Get looking for there. something to do. Yeah, New South Wales. Yeah. Dang. I, don't, I, I can't remember right now. I don't think it's that far from Sydney. I mm. mean, it's inland a little ways, but I don't think it's a, it's definitely like a, I, I want to say like a half day's drive or less. That's not bad. Might, that... be, might be quite a bit less. Might be okay. just like three, four hours. Um, so let me ask you something. Yeah. What do you think about the healing powers of like hot springs, caves, the the waters there, right? Because that, yeah, that was the original intent. Because I think that previously we talked about a story down in Arkansas. The Crescent Hotel, I believe. I think so. Yeah, it was originally. I don't believe in it. I don't believe in healing waters. You don't? Nope. Hmm. Uh, but you know, I don't. are you surprised? Well, a little bit. I mean, you sit in our hot tub and think it makes you feel better. So I don't know how well, you... Because of the jets... And certain and the hot water. And the hot water. Yes, I believe in yeah. it is good for you to sit in hot water that moves around. So yeah, in the sense that like back when they didn't have hot tubs, mm -hmm. and they could go in there and it probably helped their muscles relax. I just, I just don't believe you could like sit there and like circulate like a tumor out of your body. Well, I mean, I don't believe that either. But I think, but, but some I think people are, have believed that. Like sure, yeah. But I'm not asking you that. I'm just saying oh. like there are health benefits to it. Yeah, like I mean, sitting in hot steamy water is good for you aside from just alleviating the aches and pains of your muscles. Sure, it helps flush out. Toxins, I believe it could be like, good that way, yeah. as as could a bathtub. Yeah, but yeah. when it's from the earth, it's I mean, mm -hmm. obviously organic. But I mean. It, what what it do you just, think the water comes from? The bathtub doesn't. Well, no, but I'm saying like then you've got like all the minerals and the salts and mm -hmm. like that's not sifted out. I mean that is sifted out into your house water. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it's cool. I mean, mm, I would sit sure in it. Sure, you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I just like like if I was if I was sick, I wouldn't be like I got to get to this fucking cave water. Well, but think about like, what spend they two weeks had in this cave back water. then. Like a hot bath was way harder to to have. Oh, for sure. You, you know, just, you just sucked to be alive back then. Yeah. Well, so. There you go. So, so I mean, I, I do get the lure. If I, if I was uh, one of those uh, Aboriginal people, like back in the days before hot tubs mm -hmm. and baths, oh yeah, I'd be fucking all about soaking in that water as much as possible. Okay, okay. I'm with you there. What would you do mm -hmm. if we were on a tour? Because we've been on many, you know, guided tours. I think yeah. anybody, especially with kids, <laughs> has been on some guided tour. What if there was just an extra person? I mean, that'd be. I would lose super creepy. my fucking shit. <laughs> but I, but I like in these stories like. I don't do a head count of the I tour. <laughs> that is like the mom and me. I'm like, how many funny. people are here? Okay. So I, so I think, like, I relate to the people in these experiences. Where like, I, I would be like, huh, that's weird. I don't remember seeing them at the beginning. But I also wouldn't immediately think like, ah, oh, it's a ghost. You know? Well, I which, wouldn't which, either. Right. Which, I would be counting. Yeah, which which would make it so creepy afterwards. So that'd be kind of a cool way to see to experience a ghost, actually. I was thinking at the beginning of the story, I was like, oh, I would probably stay at this hotel. You know, this these spirits mm -hmm. sound totally benign. This sounds like a, a good way if you want to see something. This sounds like a safe. And then I was like, what are you thinking, Lindsay? If you see it then, then, mm -hmm. then you're never going to sleep again. Because then you are going to believe that every shadow in every corner of every room you're ever in is something. Right. I mean, do you think that? That like once you see something and it's confirmed by someone else, that that's it. Like yeah, you're yeah. fucked up forever. I if the I two, if, if if one of the two of us it would, it would mess me up a little bit if yeah. I had to pick you having that experience or me I would go with me like a thousand times over I don't I think, think it matters I think I would handle it psychologically better than you would oh but knowing that you saw something because knowing how practical, I wouldn't tell you I wouldn't tell you that's terrible there's no secrets in this marriage <laughs> how would you say I'd have, that I'd have to really wait and be like am I gonna tell her because she's gonna be terrified for the rest of her life oh man I'm already terrified. I, we do have some Australian and New Zealand listeners. So if you guys have been there and anything's happened to you, I would love to hear mm -hmm. to have a little confirmation. If you, could, if you could put what you've seen in like a little bottle and send it to us so we could open up and have it here in the room, even better. Well, that whole time I was feeling a little something over here. <laughs> so. I, I, now I'm, I was just saying that to be ridiculous, but now I'm just thinking that would be so crazy if you could figure out how to like send spirits to the mail you like go it was like amazon a vacuum, amazon like, someone a ghost you like suck it in you know those <laughs> like, like, air, like those air seal bags that you can get i was thinking of the movie ghostbusters yeah, where like they have that up, little thing and then they'll put it in the little whoop, mm -hmm. and then off it goes there you go and then it like you know in shipping because we all know that shippers aren't exactly delicate with things it breaks open and <laughs> now you've released it into the middle of nowhere you don't know where it is you can't track it oh man there's so many possibilities that's a great movie <laughs> um, okay, very different. Oh wait, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Whew, um, are you slow down? Uh, are you re are you ready to head uh, into the woods? I mean, I don't think I have a choice here, Dan. Very different kind of story now. I liked that first one. It was very light. It was. It if was. We could light. stay in that world. It'd be great. This is darker. This one's darker. No thanks. Decent amount of setup before it really kind of gets going. Nope. Nope. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to flag. I, I only flagged in the first one because it was lighter, but mm -hmm. it is too funny 
It takes us out of the, <laughs> okay. the zone. Uh, a, a version of the following story was posted on a little-used paranormal chat room. The person leaving it, going by the name of Derek, claims this is all too real. Okay, Derek. Derek. Sounds a lot like Darren. <laughs> no, this is not a Darren. This is not. Okay. A, I, I've rewritten it slightly to work more as a narrative, but left all the main details intact. Okay, thanks for that. The call came in just as they were packing up for the day. Derek and the other search and rescue officers dropped their bags and keys, some of them making faces, some of them looking at one another as if to say, you get it, not me. Everyone knew what a call this late in the day meant. Being outside all night with the canine units working on no sleep and combing the area until they found the missing person or the remains. Normally, half the calls they got were missing person calls, while the other half were rescues. People stuck in foothills and cliffs, uh, who or burned, who, or people who had burned themselves or gotten stung or bitten by insects. Lately, there had been mostly missing persons calls. Derek watched his supervisor, Mi uh, Mira, go over to the phone and pick it up. When she put the phone back in its cradle, he could tell from her eyes that she was worried. She'd been worried more often recently. Something had changed over the past few months. Derek had always wanted to be a search and rescue officer. He loved the outdoors. And an experience in his youth, when he'd gotten lost on a hike, had cemented his desire to be the kind of person that went out into the wilderness to save other people. He remembered that hiking trip, being around 12 or 13, thinking he was stuck in a deep ravine, until he saw the flashlights of the search and rescue officers, and they told him to keep calm. In the end, they'd shown him a way out, and he realized he hadn't been in much danger to begin with. The situation had looked much scarier than it actually was, but he had only figured that out because someone level-headed and confident had showed up and pointed that out to him. And he wanted to be that person for other people. Of course, as he'd gotten older, Derek was in his 30s now. And as he'd put in more hours, he learned that there were less ideal parts of the job. There were some really depressing, really sad parts. Like when he had to tell a family that their parent or their child had died. Or when the search and rescue team got there just a little late to help. There were the people who tried to help themselves and only got themselves into more trouble. And the list went on and on. And then recently, he'd been dealing with something else. He and everyone he worked with had been dealing with something else. A phone call came in that led to something very, very different than any of them had experienced before. All the sad missions were tragic, sure, but they were also always explainable. Things had been happening lately, however, that were not explainable. Time now for the tale of Search and Rescue. The month before, Derek and the others had been busy with the surge of late summer campers and two cases that had come in had been really strange. Both of them involved children. Most of the time when children wandered off on a path, they usually didn't wander very far. And that was true for the first case. It was late August and a man called in to report his daughter missing. He said he'd been hiking with his wife and daughter, who was only nine years old, when the daughter had decided to climb up a boulder to get a better view of the woods. The boulder wasn't enormous or too tall, so the dad told her to go ahead and the daughter scampered up. And then, after she climbed out of his view for no more than a few seconds, 10 seconds tops, he called to her and didn't hear anything back. This entire time, his wife had been on the other side of the boulder. She couldn't see or hear the daughter either. The man then climbed up the boulder quickly himself, and his daughter was nowhere to be found. He frantically ran around the immediate vicinity of the boulder while his wife stayed at the base where their daughter climbed up just in case she was hiding and then returned. They both screamed her name until their voices were hoarse. They both called, or then they called for help, and Derek and his search and rescue team never found the girl. Oh my God. For weeks, Derek puzzled over her disappearance deep into the night. If she went up, she had to come down, didn't she? But neither her mother nor her father ever saw her come back down. What had happened up there? Had they lied to them? Where the hell could she have gone? The other strange and possibly related case came a few weeks later in September. It had come in a report from another set of parents who'd taken their children, this time to pick mushrooms. The family had two kids, a boy and a girl, both of them elementary school age, and the parents had kept a close eye on them both until the boy went to go look at a nearby bird's nest. They later said that they couldn't have taken their eyes off of him for more than a minute. His sister followed, and suddenly, both of them were gone. Shit. When their devastated and frightened parents couldn't find them after screaming out their names and circling around the place where they'd last been seen, they called search and rescue, and Derek and his team went out to canvas the area. Luckily, this time, they found the little girl, and they found her quickly. But when Derek asked her where her brother was, she looked away, like she didn't want to answer. He found this reaction extremely odd. It was very atypical. 
Anytime he tried to find someone before, their family members, if anything, were too eager to help and flooded him with unhelpful and unnecessary details. He couldn't remember anyone, kid or not, being hesitant to tell him anything. For a split second, he wondered, had there been an accident? Had she done something that led to her brother getting hurt and now she didn't want to get in trouble? Where's your brother? Derek asked again. It's important you tell me anything you can remember. We're trying to help him. Tears welled up in her eyes and she started talking to him, uh, shifting her clenched jaw back and forth. Right bef- uh, Then she stopped right before he asked her a third time. She said, he's with the man. Derek's stomach dropped. Had he been kidnapped? What man, he asked. And she said the man said he wanted to play with Bryce for a while. He gave me some berries and told me to be quiet. Was Bryce scared, Derek asked her. His stomach sunk further. This had to be an abduction. But what kidnapper sat at a spot an hour into the woods waiting for a family with small children to just pass by suddenly at random? Derek would soon tell his team to look for traces that someone had been camping out there. Trash, camping equipment, anything that would prove that another human being had been around. No, the little girl said, not scared. He, he was riding on the man's shoulders. The man had a weird face. Weird how? Derek asked. But the girl wouldn't reply. She seemed really scared. This looked bad. This looked really, really bad. Someone from the medical team then led the girl off to get checked out, and when Derek checked in with her doctors a few days later, they said that the girl would only talk about the man's weird face, and they couldn't get any other details out of her. What's more, when he asked his team if they'd found anything in the woods that might indicate someone was there, they all shook their heads. Nothing. Not even a footprint that hadn't come from the family. Derek and his team searched for weeks, never saw a trace of the boy, never found anything, never found any trace of the strange man. And one night, after lying sleepless at home, unable to get the case out of his head, Derek drove down to the area with a search dog and Hmm. set about doing his own probe of the area. Sounds like a bad idea. When no one else would be around to distract him, he felt that there had to be something they'd missed, something everyone had missed. He parked at the trailhead and got the dog out of the back of a Subaru, then let it sniff a shirt the parents had given the rescue team. The dog picked up the scent of Derek. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Picked up the scent, and then Derek followed the dog down the trail. The night was overcast, and Derek's flashlight was the only light he had to go by. The jingling of the dog's tags faded in and out as it crisscrossed in front of him. Derek tried to keep focused on the sound of the dog's tags, but something kept drawing his attention away from it. He kept hearing a slow buzzing sound coming from just off the path. At first, Derek thought it sounded like an animal, a coyote, or a bobcat. He knew that the hissing sounds they, he knew the hissing sounds they made at night when they sensed a threat. And this sounded a lot like one of those sounds, but not exactly like those sounds. It seemed off somehow. Then he realized why. It didn't seem like an animal uh, sound. It didn't seem like a hissing sound made by some predator. It seemed like the kind humans were taught to make in response to immediate animals they came across on the trails. The more he listened, the more Derek became sure it was the sound of some human, not an animal. He whipped his flashlight around and shouted, Who's there? But there was nothing. Derek kept going, wandering through the forest as he followed the search dog, still hearing this buzzing sound. Sometimes it was fainter, sometimes it was louder, sometimes it sounded close, like it was just around a curve in the path. Derek started wishing he had brought along someone else. (laughs) How far in had the family said they'd gone? Was it two miles? Was it three? Abruptly, the dog stopped. They'd reached the front of a rocky wall. Derek looked up and saw a cliff's edge. It was straight, sheer cliff, no handholds. Derek swept his flashlight in front of him, looking up for a path. Some way, someone could scramble up this cliff if they wanted to. Experimentally, he tried to boost himself up the cliff, immediately fell back to the ground, landing with a hard thud on his heels. How could the boy's trail lead to this cliff? How could it go up this cliff? Who could climb such a thing? Who could climb with a kid on their back? The dog whined, sat with its hands on its paws, its ears pinned back. Derek frowned. It felt like something was out there, more specifically that it was above him perched up on the very cliff he couldn't scale. He tried to spot it, but his flashlight wouldn't shine far enough up to see it. Without the proper gear to scale this cliff, he knew it was pointless to continue, and he walked back down the trail to his car. And every night since that search, he thought about that strange sound and what might have been up that cliff. Flash forward now uh, to the search and rescue call that opened the story. It came in during mid-November, a time when they didn't get too many calls. Not many people were hiking, though they occasionally got rescue calls from real adrenaline junkies, people that liked to camp in freezing temperatures and scale mountains when the danger of an avalanche was ever present. No thanks. 
Mira took the call and then told Derek and some other rescuers that two campers had gone up to the mountains a few days ago, and now, of course, they were missing. One of the campers' brothers was the caller, and he said that his brother and his companion hadn't come back when they were supposed to. Preparing for a long night in the freezing cold, Derek and his team put on their outerwear and climbing shoes and drove out. The terrain quickly became too rocky to drive on, and before long, the team had to do some serious climbing. Looking up the wall of the rock before them, Derek flashed on the last time he had been to this place, the night of his solo search. This was the exact same spot. He thought about sensing some man near him that night, and he got the goosebumps. Then he shook him off, tried to put thoughts of feeling like someone was near him that night, watching him perhaps out of his mind. They were here to find two people that needed help. He and his co-rescuers co -rescuers scaled the wall, working late into the night. It was icy, so they had to go slower than normal, and Derek's eyelids were starting to get pretty heavy when he suddenly heard Mira shout, Over here! They'd found someone. It was the caller's brother. He was trapped in a small crevasse on the mountainside, and it was obvious as soon as Derek saw him that he had a broken leg. They found out that he'd been there for almost two days, Oof. and a big gash in his leg was obviously beginning to get infected. Another day or so of being lost, and he could have easily died. The team got him into a chopper, and as Derek lifted him, he heard the man start babbling. I was doing fine. I was doing fine. It was all going okay. Then we got to the top, and there was there was this man there. He was he was wearing a jacket and uh, normal pants, not climbing clothes. He didn't have on any equipment. I should have left. I, I knew something wasn't right. I, I should have I shouldn't have said anything. But I I asked him how he got up there, and he and he turned around. Oh my God! I, I should have left. His face. His face was just blank. He didn't have a face. How could he not have a face? I turned around and tried to get away from him. I, I tried to climb back. I fell. I could hear him coming after me. He, he kept left out these, these muffled screams. He's making this noise. And then this guy getting the rescue chopper broke down and started sobbing. The guy was so, so shaken up, he didn't even ask about his companion. Derek prepared himself for the worst when he went to continue to look for this companion. Maybe Derek thought in this guy's rush to get away from whatever this thing was, he, he pushed her down. Maybe she'd fallen. Or maybe whatever was lurking in these woods, what Derek had heard that night he'd searched alone, had already gotten her. While Derek helped get the man in the chopper, a few of his teammates left to keep looking for this woman. When he joined them after the chopper left the, or left the area and went off to the hospital, he was pleasantly surprised to find the missing young woman sitting with them. Oh. Thank God they'd rescued, rescued them both. She looked perfectly fine, other than the fact that she was missing her pack. She didn't seem to have any injuries. She was uh, pretty clearly in shock. How could she not be? But she was able to climb back down and hike out with the team, back down to their vehicles. As they made their way down the mountainside, Derek watched this young woman keep glancing behind them repeatedly, as if checking on someone that was following them, although Derek was the only person behind her. I'm here, Derek finally reassured her. You're going to be fine. The young woman shook her head. Not you. The other guy. The man with no face. Oh, boy. Derek's stomach dropped. What other guy? Did you just say no face? The girl months ago, now the man tonight, both had spoken of a man with either a weird face or no face. What was going on? Derek prayed she was just in shock. and She really didn't know what she was saying or talking about. They kept walking. She kept glancing behind them. It was freaking Derek out. She was clearly terrified. She kept looking back as if she really expected to see someone. He now started to glance back as well. Please don't be back there, he thought. As they got closer and closer to their vehicles, the more agitated the young woman became. Then she suddenly stopped and turned around and grabbed Derek by the arm. She looked past him uh, and said, don't look back. He's right back there. Uh, uh, uh. Faintly, Derek now heard that buzzing sound. They had to go, Derek thought, right fucking now. They were almost back at their camp. Move, Derek shouted at the woman and his team. We, we got to pick it up. We're being followed. By what? Mira yelled. Just go. Go now, Derek screamed. They all started running. They were almost there. Derek could see their vehicles in the distance. Then the woman, who was right in front of him, stopped running. What are you doing? yelled Derek. He could still hear the buzzing. We're almost safe. He'll find me, she said. Once you see him, he always knows how to find you. Derek didn't want to ask her how she could know this. He knew better than to ask what she was talking about. They had to get out of there. The woman then said, he doesn't like you, Derek. He doesn't like your tattoo. Derek felt sick. How, how did she know his name? She must have heard one of his team say it. His tattoo? He did have one, only one, and she couldn't have seen it. He was so bundled up against the cold that barely a sliver of his face was showing between his, between his scarf and his face. His tattoo, a Celtic wheel, was between his shoulder blades. 
As he's thinking this, as he's being puzzled, the woman bolts. <gasps> she runs back away from their vehicles, no. back into the forest. We've got a runner, he yelled to his team. The two rescue team members closest to Derek take off past him, uh, catching her duck around some rocks with her flashlights. Mirror runs past him as well. Derek stands frozen still. The buzzing is getting louder. It feels like it's coming uh, out of his ears. Then he hears someone scream. It comes from the direction where everyone was running. Shit. Derek, terrified, runs towards them. He had to. This was his job, a job he really didn't like to do right now. Soon, he sees all four of his team standing together in a row, looking down at something. As he runs towards them, one yells, Careful! Stop, Derek! It's a cliff! He slows down <gasps> as he approaches, and then he steps up to the cliff's edge alongside them, looks down. The woman they had just rescued lay about Shit. 80 feet below, not moving, clearly dead. Did anyone see her jump? Derek asked. Everyone shook their head no. She apparently fell and never made a sound. It was one of his team that screamed when they saw them or saw her. Never screamed as she fell. The two guys who'd made it to the cliff's edge first said they were damn lucky not to fall in after her. It was a sneaky, dangerous little ravine. Then out of the corner of his eye, Derek sees a dark shape <clears> moving <throat> through the woods. He knows it's the man with no face. The buzzing, now the loudest he had ever heard it. Feels like his ears are about to start to bleed. He can tell the others hear it as well. Back to the vehicles, he yells. Now, we'll retrieve the body at first light. Let's go. The crew tears back down to where they parked. They're all spooked. They all know that something is very not right about any of this. By the time they'd shut themselves inside their vehicles, the buzzing had almost completely gone away. They sit for about three hours until first light. For Derek, over three hours of waiting for that sound to come back, waiting for the man to reveal himself at any moment. Who was he? What was he? He knew he was somehow responsible for killing that woman. And now that Derek knew he was out there in the woods, had been out there for months at least, how was he supposed to do his job again? Yeah, no shit. How was he supposed to ever feel safe in the woods? Why didn't he have a face? That's the end of that story. Yeah. Yeah, a little different one. Ay, 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 ay. I don't have words. <laughs> yeah, it's a odd, it's very, very odd story. I like I like that it was just yeah, different setting than we've kind of done before, different circumstances. And um I mean obviously probably for a lot of people, like for me, this makes me think of like random disappearances in the woods where you just Yeah. N- they never find the remains, they never find the person. Which is always so crazy to me, especially in modern times. It's mm-hmm. like we have all of the resources. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy. Right. But we have all the resources, all the the manpower, the dogs, the whatever, just fucking every search and rescue tool you could possibly think of. Right, right. My God. So no pictures associated with this story. Oh, thank I, you. I did want to show a picture of something that we may talk about in a future story, though, because when I looked, uh, man with no face, uh, this image came up. I feel a, like I don't want to look at this. This is of a Japanese legend, the Napara Bow. No thanks. The ghost with no face. Hell fucking no. Did you look? No. Uh, Did you look? Uh, like enough that I don't want to look back. The creepy picture. Why are you staring at it? It's going to get you. <laughs> the eye. The no eye thanks. is so creepy. Uh, the little tiny eye there. When you and say then, no uh, face, I immediately go to Game of Thrones. Mm, the man with no face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That character. And, well, yeah. And or the man with a thousand faces. Something I like, can't remember. It's been a while. Well, and it's not a guy i mean there's a guy that like works there or whatever yeah. but it's um oh what's her face the cute <laughs> i know young, yeah the little one yeah i can't think of her name with but her the, little sword yeah and she's always there with mm-hmm. all the different there's like all these faces on the wall okay good let's go <laughs> that is fucking creepy the <sighs> man with no face i i was having such a hard time not getting upset because i think about all the times that i go for little hikes with the kids mm-hmm. and kyler loves to go off on his own he has always been and, and i think this is a pretty typical of most young kids and then specifically boys every young boy i've ever been around have to climb <laughs> me when I was a fucking kid, yeah. everything i know kyler was so into that everywhere i mean even if we were just walking through like a city he just didn't want to walk on the sidewalk if yep. there was like a flower bed he wanted to be up doing some balancing act like parkour to, type yeah. stuff on the side and yeah hiking it's like yeah whenever there's been like a big boulder off he goes like, yeah like a moth to a light oh you know? my god still and still like that so you know mm-hmm. where we live we go to tubs hill a lot to yeah. hike and i'm specifically thinking of you get to a certain part in the trail and and this is like a well-lit middle of the day yeah, well so traveled many people trail. around mm-hmm. like there's no reason for anything to happen but yeah listen it, it does he always goes up on this one giant boulder. And at a certain point, I'll be down here with Monroe and I can see him. I can see him. And then I can't. Right. And it freaks me out. Even, I mean, he's almost 15. Well, at this point he is 15. Yeah. And it's like, 
you know, he's got his phone, find my friend. Like, I've got all the resources to find him, but it's still, as a parent, right. it freaks me out. So when you were talking about those kids going missing, it was so hard not to just, like, just inherently become upset. Because yeah. you can imagine yourself in that exact scenario. It's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Kids are fucking, do do do. They're dodgy, those little fuckers. <laughs> I know. I thought about that. The, the, first, the first part of that story, the girl in the boulder, that's what made me think about Kyler, too. Like, how many, because I have been I wrote exactly, that too. yeah, I've been exactly where that dad is, where you watch them go up and then, then you lose sight of them. Mm-hmm. And then just Your how stomach just drops. horrific that would be if they're just poof, gone. I can't. Like, like, in a special, well, I mean, in any circumstance, it would be horrific. Right. But then to add another layer to it, uh, with this one, where you just can't get your mind around, like, where they could have gone. Right. Like, how could that have even happened? how is that even plausible? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, the scenario with two kids, because it's like, oh, yeah, that could totally be us. Right. You find one, but not the other? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. God. Yeah. What was that movie that we watched? Oh, uh, do, 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 do. there's a murder. The kids are, okay, hold on. Oh, is it True Detective, maybe? <laughs> you have to give me more details. I know, hold uh. on. I'm trying to find the words. I think it might have been True Detective. I didn't want to send you down the wrong rabbit hole by Got saying it. it was a movie. Um, uh, a husband and wife, the wife is just like, it sounds like she goes missing for days sometimes. The dad is working on his car. The two kids. Third season of True Detective. Right? Oh, yeah. that like, mm 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 Yes. That's all yes. I will say. It was really good. Season two, not great. Season three, fucking awesome. Yes. Season and, one, incredible. Season three, incredible. Season two, uh, what happened? Who and knows? actually season they two. They tried too hard in season two. And season two, Colin Farrell, he did a great job. I thought it was one of his best acting roles, you know? Yeah, it just. It, but it just wasn't, I don't know, something was missing. Well, poor direction probably. I, I love you do that. I've done this too. When you first did that thing, like when you have you have a thought in your head, yeah. But <laughs> like, so you have all the context inside. I know it's so hard. To... And like, hey, what was that thing we saw? And then that's <laughs> it. Like Kyler does that a lot. He'll he'll have like he'll be thinking about something, and then he'll just ask this question like based on where he's been thinking now for two minutes. Right, right. But you are in a completely different headspace. Yeah. And he's like, hey, what was that, that we were doing the other day? Uh, you're going to have to give me a little more details. <laughs> I know. I then. love it when he says it. Hey, like, do you remember that time we were at that place and we did that thing? <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, like literally that vague. Uh, we've been in a lot of places and done oh things. Oh my God. And also like with kids and teenagers, you know, they're just their brains aren't fully developed and they are <laughs> developing. So I feel like their brains just kind of skip around a bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Last night, Kyler and I were playing chess and we got to the end. Now I am a, a brand new chess You're player. You're a noob. I'm a newbie. And Kyler's been playing for a while and he's reading the books and it's like two things with him. One of my favorite things that he likes to say is, oh, you should, you should, like, mm-hmm. you should read this book. You should watch the show. I'm like, dude, I have a fucking job. <laughs> like, and I have a job know, that eats up about too. fucking 80 hours of my life every week between right. the kids and our life and our jobs here. It's yeah. like, and he just, so we'll be playing chess and he's like, well, you could like learn how to do better moves. I'm going to give you this book. You should right. really read this book. I'm like, motherfucker, I haven't read a book in two years. <laughs> like, I don't have time for your fucking chess books. But of course, it's always like, oh, okay. But we get to the end of the game and yeah. I, of course, lost. I have not beat him yet, but I, God willing, I will one of these days. And I didn't know this about chess, but when you are at checkmate and you, uh-huh. have, you, right, you have no move, there's no mm-hmm. way of getting out of it. You don't complete the last move. Right. You either right. say like I surrender. No, is it? The game just. I, I think don't know. I surrender. I don't, know. I don't think that's the right word. But anyways, he was so annoyed that you didn't follow protocol. Yeah, a protocol, and he's the person teaching me. He right. never told me that, and so he was. He like, is very into rules. Fucking rules. Oh mm-hmm. man, he's gonna mm-hmm. have a rough go of it when he gets a little bit older, <laughs> especially that he wants to go into politics. Get uh. the fuck out of here. <laughs> rules my ass. But he, uh, he was so annoyed, and you know me. Yeah. <sighs> I hate to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So that is like not a good combination. Rule follower and hates to be wrong. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay. And he's like, well, you just shouldn't have done that. And I was like, okay. And so he wanted me to like put the piece back and do it properly. And I was like, Kyler, I didn't know. And he was like, well, like he's just, how could I, how could, he's so annoyed. How could I not know? And it sounds sounds stressful. And it is just such like a kid thing. Meanwhile, while that's going on with you, I'm downstairs playing Fortnite with Monroe and it's awesome. Yeah. Well, she's so, she's so chill. She's so Chill. And she's a she's a noob, as she likes to say too. And uh-huh. I'm a noob. And then we just go on little adventures. And we don't care how many people kill us. I know she she doesn't care. Well, she, Monroe also says, "I uh, chaos is my god." <laughs> when so, she plays games, true. Yep, yep, yep. She is destructive. Bless her. But anyways, I digress. Are you? Do you have a little squish squish? I do. I do. I have. Who, who you got? Who you I got, got? Uh, Frankenstein today. That's so cute. Can All you right. hold him up? Mm-hmm. He's so cute and tiny. 
<laughs> I love him. I got teeny tiny Frankenstein. It's hysterical. I'm sure, I'm sure he was. I'm sure he's gonna keep me safe. I'm sure if something comes in here, yeah, yeah, and is gonna try and get me, that thank God I have tiny squishy Frankenstein. Because if not, we're both gone. Listen, it's whatever. This is, you... the, this is the one thing keeping this evil spirit world from tearing this room apart. It is whatever you put your faith into. Okay. <laughs> so if that is what you believe, it will protect you. Ah, I believe in tiny Frankenstein. Perfect. You can start like a whole new religion. <laughs> tiny Frankenstein. Um, okay. Holy creepiness in this story. Okay. Uh, now this story has us exploring a hat man or a shadow person, which I know I referenced having that this story was coming up, I think like last week. So I was talking mm -hmm. about how freaked out I've been. And this is the story that fucking sent me there. Now this fan who sent the story in, reach out to me after another fan story that we had back in episode oh, cool. 69, Paul's story. I'll, I'll give you a little like recap on that. So you're not like, wait, what? Yeah. But it, it really stuck out to this person. And interestingly enough, I heard from several people who said that they could have sworn that Paul's experience with sleep paralysis and shadow people matched their own almost to a T, which fucking made Whoa. it even worse for me. Um, and I just also feel like it's a good time to say that our bedroom has been giving me the fucking heebie-jeebies. Okay. So here's where it kind of all comes from. And it could be coincidental, but like, it just feels... Okay. I don't know. So can, can I get this out of my system? Just, yeah. just take one second before yeah, what we go do you forward. Need to say? I just uh, I was proud of myself for not saying. What earlier, did I say wrong? No, you, you said everything right. But what I was going to do is just uh, act like I was listening to. You, but then when you were done talking, I was going to say, I, "I'm sorry, I stopped listening when you said 69." But uh, I, but, but I did. You're so funny. But I didn't. But I still feel compelled just to get it out of my system that I held I, that in. You are very much that way. You yeah. there is no holding anything in, which is great because that makes you the world's worst liar, which means <laughs> I can trust you infinitely. <laughs> just a little, little, little inside scoop. Okay, so now just a, a little refresh, just a, a little bit, a little two paragraphs from Paul's story to refresh yours and our listeners' memories okay. back from episode 69. Okay, so Paul's story, um, he had said, my wooden door was completely open and standing in the doorway was a man. He was tall and slender and wearing a long coat. He had a kind of short top hat, if that makes sense. He had no eyes, only black holes where eyes should be. My sleep paralysis went on and off, but nothing too drastic until it became physical. I started w waking up to scratches on my shoulders, as if someone had taken a small safety pin and scratched three claw-like marks onto each shoulder. I laughed them off because obviously I had done them somehow, right? This went on and on for months, until one night I woke up to sleep paralysis and my eyes darted around, and at the corner of my bed, I saw his face, his hatless, old, bitter face. Do you remember that? And like he had the medallion mm -hmm. that his friend had given yes, him? Yes, yes. Okay, so this email comes in, and it just fucking, woo-hoo, here we go. Hey, Dan and Lindsay, I found your podcast about two weeks ago, and I have to say, I'm binging it. Yes. <laughs> I'm a lifelong creep, so these stories are right up my alley. I started at the beginning, and I'm almost caught up. I had to take a moment to write to you after the episode, Cover the Mirrors. You'll recall it's an episode with two stories about the hat man. After listening to it, I'm coming to believe that something I had written off as an active childhood imagination and night terrors may have been the real deal. I grew up in a house that my father built. It was a large house and my bedroom was off the garage entrance at the end of a hall. The door to my bedroom was at a convergence of sorts, several halls leading to different parts of the house, all broken off from a small foyer that my bedroom door looked out on. My bed was on the far wall, and when I say my and when I lay on my side with the door open, I could see two hallways, one which broke off perpendicularly into a granny flat. I couldn't look down the hall. When I was around seven or eight, I started seeing pretty vividly a man in a bowler hat peering around the edge of the hallway into my bedroom at night. I could tell he was short and stocky. I thought I never saw his body with a white face. I thought I never saw his body with a white face that was worn and leathery like a baseball mitt. His eyes were sunken and wrinkled, but bright white with only a prim, pinprick of a pupil, no color whatsoever. And he always had a big gummy smile showing all his blackened, rotting teeth. It was as though he didn't have any lips. The smile took over the entire bottom half of his face. He would lean unnaturally around the corner of the hidden hallway and just stare at me. Ugh. I would be so afraid I couldn't bring myself to even get up and close the door. I also had the eerie feeling that if I didn't continue to stare at him, he would be able to come and get me, as though by looking him, I was keeping him at bay. I never told my parents. I was a very imaginative kid who liked spooky things, and I thought, maybe I was just scaring myself. 
I started remembering to close my door of my bedroom before I got into bed. Many years later, my junior year of college, far away from my parents' house, I started having night terrors. I believe they were stress-induced as I had never had them before and I was having some trouble with depression. The first time it happened, I woke up very early in the morning, or I thought I did, because I couldn't move. I was very aware of my surroundings, but my body was completely paralyzed. I was in bed with my then boyfriend and I tried to talk to him. He was still asleep, but I couldn't even open my mouth. I tried to make little movements, just move my pinky finger, but it seemed impossible. It was then that I noticed the shadow in the corner of the room. It was clearly a human shape, but made of black mist with no real weight to it. The human was short and stocky. I felt myself start to panic, and again I felt the surreal knowledge that if I stopped looking at the thing in the corner, it would somehow be able to get me. Finally, my pinky finger moved, and it was like the spell had been broken. I shot up in bed, finally waking up my boyfriend, and the black shape was gone. This happened quite a few more times, sometimes at my boyfriend's house, but mostly at my studio apartment where I lived, alone. Always the shadow man would stare at me from a distance, despite not truly having eyes, and always the spell would be broken as I was a- and always the spell would break as soon as I was able to make the tiniest movement. A friend of mine explained he too had experienced night terrors and that they were all with humanoid shadows looming in the corner of his vision. My shadows weren't tall, and sometimes he, or it, would have a clearer form, and when it did, it looked like it was wearing a bowler hat. I assumed the shadow things must be part of the night terror gig, and the more I looked into it, it was true. Just an imaginary manifestation, and so I just accepted it. As I dealt with my depression better, mainly through art and sketching, the night terrors became less and less until they seemingly stopped. After college, I moved back in with my parents for a short time as I transitioned into the real world. I stayed in my old bedroom, which had been converted into a guest room, and the new bed faced the door. One night, I came home late after working a 16-hour day. I had two jobs, and the second shift ended at midnight. I was so exhausted. I went to my room, took off my shoes, and just fell into my bed. As I started to drift into sleep, I looked out of my bedroom door, which I had forgotten to close, and I saw the corner of the hidden hallway, and I was struck by impending dread. In that moment, the hat man leaned curiously out of the hallway with his creepy, gleeful smile. As always, my gut told me not to look away. My brain thinking I knew better, told me that it was just a night terror and you needed to move. I didn't have that paralyzed feeling like I couldn't move, but I was so scared I didn't want to move. The hat man was so clear. No shadowy or formless feelings like the night terrors I knew, but I also felt that he looked like real flesh and blood. I was torn between exhaustion and dread, paternally knowing if I stopped looking at him, he would come and get me. But my brain won out. It was imaginary, just like when you were a kid, and so I closed my eyes to sleep. But I didn't fall asleep. I knew he was still there. Something inside me knew he was moving towards my room. In an attempt to rid myself of my own imaginary demons, I opened my eyes to prove to myself that this wasn't real. But there he was. In the doorway to my room, his eyes bigger than ever, he looked delighted. It looked like he was wearing a black coat that covered his entire body. I couldn't see his feet, but I knew he had shuffled over to the doorway, and now I was staring into his eyes, and he was trapped until I would shut my eyes again. His, his smile never faded, and that's when he actually spoke in a cracked whisper, mm. like someone who hasn't used their voice for a long time. I'm not even sure his mouth moved when he said, you are home. Oh my God. I shot up like times before when my sleep paralysis had when my sleep paralysis broke and rolled off the opposite side of my bed, turning away from him terrified. I got to my feet quickly, not 100% sure what I was going to do, but by the time I faced the doorway, he was gone. I rushed to the bedroom door and closed it. I never slept with the door open ever again. That was about 10 years ago. I think I had convinced myself the whole ordeal was a particularly vivid night terror, somehow manifested from my childhood memory. But if it was childhood memory, was he actually there when I was a kid? I can't tell you for sure. All I do know is after listening to your podcast and the other hat man, grinning man encounters, I'm beginning to believe he was real. Now, I mentioned that I dealt with my depression and night terrors through sketching. So not long after the final visit, I drew a few sketches of my hat man. Sketching him exercised him from my life in some way. I have never seen him again, but I won't sleep in view of any open doors. Weird. 
One of the reasons I'm such a lifelong creep is that I find a lot of catharsis in stories like the ones you're sharing. It's amazing how clearly the memory of these experiences come back to me after listening to your show. The original sketch I did was lost, but I've included a couple of the Hatman sketches I did find from more recent years. Please note, I'm not an artist by any means. The sketchings only helped me to confront my inner demons, so to speak, and so it didn't matter if they were good or not. Mm -hmm. Feel free to share them. Maybe someone else has seen my hat man too, and I'll know for sure if this reoccurring childhood memory was something I created in my own head or something real I managed to escape. I'll be smudging my house tonight, maybe doing a few sketches just in case telling the story somehow brings him back. Keep up the great work and spooky tales. My husband, who doesn't usually enjoy podcasts, has been listening with me, and Lindsay's reactions always crack him up. So you're <laughs> welcome. It's nice to have something we can listen to together, so thanks for that. Stay spooky. Cece. Cece, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see these sketches. Yeah, okay, so picture, it's just two sketches. We'll okay. bring up picture one. Uh, that's uh -huh. not a fun dude to see. Absolutely not. And not, not a fan of his teeth. Right, and like... And the gum, the thing, the yeah. Missing, it's like... Uh-huh, uh-huh. Like that, uh And that that particular da, hat. Da, 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 that bowler hat. Uh-huh. I'm like, okay, I get it, Cece. I get it. I would be losing my shit. Which, mind yeah. you, like, I am having, like, my own sleep issues right now, and I swear. You saw this fucking guy? Oh, I feel like it's there. I absolutely, and, and I am trying to remind myself that this is what I do for a living, and that I'm reading these stories, and it's it's in my brain. If that little face, like, came up... Over the foot of the bed. Oh my god! I mean, I mean, even if it is sleep paralysis, and for uh -huh. new for, for new listeners, if you're popping over here, I mean, you probably got this vibe from me already. But know that, like, you know, whenever we tell these stories, we don't, we can't source them. We we weren't there. All this stuff is just somebody's claims, right? So there is always. I always am trying to tell myself that, like, well, maybe there's a reasonable explanation. Maybe they just, uh, uh, like, a hallucination or imagination or whatever. But no matter what it was, yeah. Even if it was your imagination, even if it was scientifically proven some kind of like brain <laughs> thing with sleep paralysis, that face at the foot of the bed, no matter what the reason, yeah. Outside of just like an actual prank, any reason, it's just terrifying. Terrifying. And how I would think, that not give you nightmares? Well, and I think for Cece, what I found. So so interesting about this story was that childhood home, mm -hmm. then her own um, studio apartment, yeah. her boyfriend's apartment, yeah. and back at her parents' home. It's right. so like it just kept happening. Right. So I could see, I can see two sides of that. One side of it is that what well, kept happening because she kept having sleep paralysis, and right. that was what would right. happen. But the other part of me is like, or. Well, how, why did it suddenly go away when she sketched it out and sort of yeah. exercised it from her life? I don't know. It just feels... And, and why it's like with the hat stuff, what I keep thinking about, and, and I have read sleep paralysis like studies and things, and you know, like it, it's so weird that a shadowy type image, I, I remember it's been a while, but it's something about like, it's like, it's like your, it's like your kind of body transposed off it's it it doesn't make it, it's it's very odd mm -hmm. like like okay they can stimulate this part of the brain and then you know at this point in sleep and then that creates this type of image but why that image why 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 do they have a fucking hat like what does that have to do with anything it's just it's all very strange why can't it be like a beautiful woman <laughs> right like even you, like, wh yeah. like why does it have to be something fucking creepy and why and yeah and, sp and so specific with the hat it's like mm -hmm. uh, what well, how is that even scientifically explained, it's, it's uh -huh. all so, even when you read the studies, there's still something like, Ugh. It feels a little. <laughs> yes, I get, you know, every time you stimulate this part with like this little bit of electricity, it does create this phenomena. But why? Why that phenomena? Well, that's science. Always asking the why. We yeah. do have one more sketch that, and that, yeah. that is somehow that is worse to me. The eyes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like the wide eye with just one little speck. A, oh, that is, yeah, that's really disturbing. Sure is because sure even is. though it's like she, you know, she clarifies like, "Hey, I'm not an artist." I mean, she sketches right. better than than I could on this. Uh -huh. I couldn't draw that. But but like, it, even though it's you know, I don't want to say a crude sketch, but like a rougher sketch, it my brain transforms uh -huh. that into a very real image. Yeah. Oh yeah. One hundred percent easily. Which I'm like, why does that happen? Right. Why Why does my mind kind of feel like you know that guy? Uh huh. Uh huh. I don't like that. I'm telling you, just like the last. You know, we work weeks in advance, so I'm always doing these stories weeks in advance. So my weeks of terror, trying to fall asleep, my inability to sleep, yeah. my, my thought that every shadow is something, it's like that's what I'm fucking afraid of right now. That, ugh, yeah. that's, just, that's a good thing to be afraid of. Mm, I should have showed it to you sooner. You'd have had more sympathy. <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> All right. So our next story is definitely a bit odd. Uh, we have a couple of cousins. There's three people in this story, all having back-to-back experiences all in one day. Okay. And, and from what I can, what, what I take from this story, that they've all felt and saw the same thing. So, you know, there's always that thing when but you- they were when, separate. Same, same day, but they, were they together? Oh, no, they, they all saw the same thing together. I get you. Yeah. The two cousins saw, had one experience together yes. and then three all together later. Oh, gotcha. So two people are in both. One person is only in one part. Got it. But it's always that thing of like when more than one person can corroborate a story, when more than, Mm -hmm. well, obviously you have to have someone to corroborate, but you know, it just, man, it just makes it so much harder to... (laughs) <laughs> well, that's like several of, the little, several of the little Janolan Cave uh, stories we had earlier yeah. were of two, three, an entire tour, mm-hmm. all hearing something. And, and it is it does make it much harder to be like, eh, come on, that's nothing. Right, right. And just like, uh, without giving too much away here, what are your thoughts about breaking into abandoned places? Do you think uh, you're just fucking I'm, asking for it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm for it. It's like I, I would I would want to break into an abandoned place if I thought that there was something really cool to see there. Yeah. But then if I got in trouble, I wouldn't be like, whoa, is me. OK. It's like, nah, you know, you, you, you chose to go into a place that you are legally not supposed to be. And if some bad shit happens, it's, I think it's kind of on you. If when you yeah. break into an abandoned place is one of your motivators that you think it might be haunted or are you just going out of pure at curiosity? Point, at this point in my life, uh, I, I would probably only go to see if it was haunted or something. It'd have to be something really significant. Okay. Like when I was a kid, yeah. I would break so I was into thinking a, about your delinquent days. Oh, yeah. Then I, then I, the motivation was just because uh, I want to. It's like chaos. It, just because it was like somebody putting up a sign saying keep out. Yeah. That was the motivation. Oh, you, don't, you don't get to tell me what to do. Monroe is so your daughter. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> She's very uh, contrarian, as we say. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, here we go. It's it's quick, but it is good. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. First time writing to you. Just wanted to let you know I'm addicted to your podcast. Yes. That's so nice. I love that all these emails are like, I love you. Now in my, now in my brain, I'm like, I, I picture you just uh, scrubbing all the other emails where it's like, go fuck yourselves. Well, yes. <laughs> I have a few strange things that happened to me over the years. I'm an empath and very sensitive to paranormal things, which I totally get. I'm a total empath. When I was younger, I always could feel things lurking in the corner just out of sight. I could feel hands touch me constantly like someone trying to get my attention. But one story in particular stands out for me that I think I will never be able to forget. When I was about 12, maybe 13, my family and I went to visit our other family in North Carolina. Everything was fine and well until my cousin wanted to go four-wheeling through the woods. I jumped on the back of the four-wheeler and hung on tight to my cousin as we rushed through the trees. We were about to head back, having gone a few miles from the house. We turned the ATV around and started back towards the house when all of a sudden something just pushed me. I thought at first maybe it was a bump on the trail, but then a rush of wind hit the four-wheeler so hard that we were forced off the trail and almost flipped the ATV. This rush of wind hit us so hard that the ATV flipped onto two wheels and I had to jump off. My cousin was knocked off the ATV as well. We both stood there in the tree line looking at each other, both of us amazingly unharmed. I could tell my cousin was a bit freaked out by the weird wind push thing we had just experienced. Later that day, when we got back to the house, we decided to go for a drive and just laugh off whatever had happened earlier that day. We drove to this place just a few miles from his house where there was a run-down house. My cousin told my brother and I that this house was for sure haunted. Me, being a lover of all things creepy and spooky, was all about going into this house. As we approached the house, we immediately noticed what looked like a dead animal hanging from the rafters of the basement door entrance. So creepy. Feeling a little creeped out, but still wanting to explore the house, we carefully walked through the threshold. The dusty house whined with each step we took. The house was almost completely destroyed, with every wall being spray-painted with graffiti and holes bashed through the walls. In the kitchen, there were some pill bottles and drug paraphernalia all over the ground, surrounding a pentagram painted on the floor with what looked like bird bones and bottles filled with some kind of liquid. This was enough for my brother to get more than a little freaked out. We noticed a staircase in the corner of the living room. Both of the boys, being sufficiently scared at this point, told me to climb up the stairs and they would follow after. I timidly climbed the creaky steps, and as I reached the top, I was greeted with a tiny hallway and then a doorway opening up to a much larger room. 
This room was filled with trash, mattresses, and furniture. So much stuff, you couldn't even walk into the room. And that's when I saw it. A shadow slowly rising off the back wall. I couldn't believe exactly what I was looking at. I froze for what felt like an eternity, standing there, watching this figure just rise up. Its eyes started glowing red, and I felt this cold chill trickle down my spine. The figure lifted its hand and pointed right at me. Like someone screaming inside of my head, a deep, dark voice yelled, Get out! I felt my knees buckle as I stumbled backwards at the sound of the voice. I turned around and pushed my cousin and brother back down the stairs and out of the house. Since then, this vision still haunts me. I can still hear the loud, angry scream in my head. I try not to think about it, but every once in a while, that image burns back into my mind. I'll probably have nightmares from telling you about this, so there's that. You're welcome. <laughs> I love your show. Keep up the great work. Always a creeper, Ray. Yikes, Ray. You know, the, uh, yeah. I was having thoughts. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, that's uh, terrifying, the whole encounter, but... um. If I was, you know, with some cousins, whatever, you know, like friends and broke into some abandoned place uh -huh. and then saw the creepy animal hanging and then saw the pentagram and things, there would have been a part of me that would be like, fuck yeah. Like, <laughs> just because, like, how intense, like, that's, it's like you're, you're in your own horror movie then. Yeah, it's like, as, as a horror movie fan and just a horror fan, I'd be like, oh, we're going to see some shit here. Me being, Jackpot. Me being me, I'd be like, I'm not going in. Oh, Because that, <laughs> that would be like, I, I oh, the horror movie, I like, know how this plays out. I have the script already in my head. Oh, I just don't fucking need to go the in there. The adrenaline that you'd feel. Like, Ugh. I mean, you're waiting for some maniac to, like, slam the door and people start chanting with hoods. Oh, no, I don't think that. I think, like, what fucking transient is living in there that's fucked up on meth that's going to have superhuman strength? <laughs> I don't know that meth out transient is, is taking the time to, like, put together, like, a pentagram and, like, some... Well, babe, when a house is completely abandoned, people are in and out oh, of it. Yeah, There's a lot the of squatters. So true, it's just, true, like, true. you are risking going into a place where there could be someone fucked up on PCP or meth yeah. or heroin or just fucking homeless and desperate. Yeah. You're asking for it. But I mean, I get it. They're kids. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're just. And the yeah. the, the wind thing. Uh, Isn't that so bizarre? Weird. Yeah, because I've been on like, uh, it's been a while, but like my mom and said that have ATVs. And yeah. I, you know, I've driven around them on, a, you know, quite a few times. Yeah. And it, it would take a lot to knock you off. No shit. And if it was something strong enough to knock you off, I feel like it would almost be strong enough to knock the ATV over. I mean, that would be a tremendous gust. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've never experienced anything. So that that alone would be like, was that the wind? And that's something else. Oh, you know, well, I think that's the point. Right, right exactly, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm just saying with them too, where it's like, that wasn't, the wind doesn't do that. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, I was thinking when we got to the end of the story and you were talking about, oh, if that was me, you're getting yeah. all excited. Uh -huh. In my mind, I was already where you love to fuck with people. And I was like, oh yeah, you would go in there and whether you saw something or not, you would climb up these stairs and you would just say you saw something and you would mm. just scream and turn around and run back down to try and scare everyone else. My, my brain took it even further as mm -hmm. you were telling the story. Yes, what would you do? This, this my brain goes a lot, a lot of times too if I was preposterously wealthy uh -huh. and in this weird fantasy scenario, I also, I guess I'm just not working anymore. Uh -huh. And so I'm just entertaining myself mm -hmm. and I would would want to have an abandoned like place that the kids knew sure. and, I, and I would put all kinds of occult shit just to make it creepy and I would have an animatronic shadow thing in the corner that would scare people just out of their fucking minds so you'd have a haunted house a haunted house that's not advertised at all that has tons of keep out that no actually trespassing would be super fun to like it builds lore in the area that's what I was thinking mm -hmm. you and could then, just like you know leave find ways to like leak little bits yeah, of information into the never public never tell anything you have to put cameras up Oh my God, that would be the best like YouTube video, like a prank where like it is, I mean, this is- <laughs> We're going very far. If anybody wants far. to fund this, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you have unlimited funding and so much time- Come to Idaho. And you're risking lawsuits, all those things, then you get a piece of property, you create all this weird occult shit and you put like like a horror movie set, but you'd never tell anybody about it and you put hidden cameras. Oh my God. The, you <laughs> that would be such a great TV show. Ah, would, like, it'd be amazing. When you think about all those like ghost hunter shows, oh. if you could build a TV show of like <laughs> amateur ghost hunters and yeah. be before you cast it, before you find these people, you build this right. place, you build all the lore around it, all this shit. Yeah. And then, you know, you're like, oh, hey, we're producing this TV show and right. we want to get your, like, just set up the whole thing. It's like ah. a whole weird version of punk. Well, there is, there's something like kind of what you're talking about. It's some of the best YouTube videos I've ever seen in my life. And now I got to find them again. 
it's been years. Uh, Brian Level, you know, my friend, oh, yeah. he, he showed them to me. And it was, and we were just amazed when we watched these. Like, how, it must be very different Japan, or used to be different oh. Japan, where like different oh, litigation. Yes. Yes. And I, there is something so entertaining about seeing somebody. <laughs> this is maybe I'm a terrible person. Truly, you are. truly frightened for their life. Like they think they're about to be killed by a monster because it looks so real. And there was this prank show where like, how the fuck are they not getting sued every episode? And I mean, again, it was Japanese, not even subtitled, so I couldn't understand what they were saying. But this one, I'll never forget. <laughs> and you said like a, like a punk thing. People are brought into what they think is this audition. And, and, and uh, I think I know what you're going to say. And they're in this kind of huge green room with mirrors, like so like a big, you know, like uh, makeup mirror on the uh -huh, wall. Uh -huh. And they're in this chair by themselves in this well-lit room. They have the camera set and they're putting the – <laughs> This is such a good prank. They're getting their makeup on, getting ready. I'll never forget this one dude. He's getting ready. He's looking in the mirror. And all of a sudden, like the girl from The Ring or from Gr oh, like, uh, Grudge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like that type of Japanese, like the dark hair, the white face, that type of ghost suddenly like comes in the background of the mirror. So it looks like it should be behind you. And it's very faint at first. Oh, my God. And the guy's like nervous, of course, like, what the fuck? And then it goes away. And then he's getting like close to the mirror, like what was in there. And this actress bursts through the fucking wall. Stop. comes through like this breakable oh. mirror like so no one's getting cut this guy loses his mind of course he does the he he look up on the screen oh my god is this <laughs> it? you found it yes okay this is <laughs> oh, I built it up more in my mind oh my god he's so scared no oh. I, I know she burst through the wall at one point well I'm sure there's many versions of it Look at this guy, he throws himself. Oh, oh yeah. there she comes the wall! Oh, it's so good, he's trying to hide in the. <laughs> he's, he's like the most scared you'll ever see somebody. I would have peed my pants. Oh my god, that's so good. Do you remember that prank that's that, the, so good. that the boyfriend played on the girlfriend? She was sleeping on the Thank couch. Thank you, Joe. Do you remember that? It was like, yes. That was also that's like a another, very similar. I think, I think. That one I like better, even. But yes, that other one I can just explain it. It was uh, obviously it was shortly after the ring. Uh huh. Guy has he falls asleep with his girlfriend, wife, whatever partner uh, on the couch in this little like what do you call it when you have a foyer, the high ceiling? So like, like it's a, a half studio. upstairs, like a studio. Yeah, so or like a like a loft. Yeah, like a loft. Like, so he's able to walk up these stairs behind her, and then she falls. She's asleep down there, and he sets up like a huge prop. This took a That's lot of work. So crazy. Hang on on this kind of um, pulley system, so it looks like like in the ring, like the girl's coming out of the TV. Uh -huh. She falls asleep. He turns on the TV, the static, just like the movie. And then she's like, "What, groggy?" And then all of a sudden, it looks like this manic, this this person sized thing is flying towards her. She screamed like she could be in an institution for the rest of her life, type of scream, <laughs> and then just and then just immediately started sobbing. <laughs> Uh, like yeah. al almost inconsolable. Yeah, I believe it. Oh, oh God, I he was in it. so much trouble, but I bet, I bet. worth it. I bet. No matter. I bet. Yeah. God. Oh. Okay. Anyways, wow, okay. we have really gone off the rails sorry, here. Sorry. Okay. So we have one more okay. uh, tale that actually isn't so much spooky as it is really interesting. So since yeah. we're kind of like lightened up the show, this is a great time okay. to have this one. Um, I mean, there are for sure signs of something going on here, mm -hmm. but the the overall story. Uh, uh, it shouldn't send you over the edge. But what okay. I loved about this is the famous history attached to it in regards to H.H. H. Holmes. Oh, yes. Yeah. The murder castle. Yes, yes. And it, it like sent me down this whole uh, rabbit hole. Like I forgot all the things I knew about him. And I also forgot about that amazing puzzle we got from Holly Carden. Oh, it's so good. This, like, since we're so digressed right now. Yeah. If you are looking for a good gift mm -hmm. for a horror lover... Holly Carden, these puzzles How that she does. How do you does, find it? I can't, I can't. I don't, I, you can just Google her. I'm sure oh, you can oh, find it. it. Okay, it, I'm sure okay. she has a website. But yeah. she sent us this H.H. H. Holmes murder castle puzzle. It's the most intricate, most beautiful, most difficult puzzle I've ever done. <laughs> but when it was done, it was yeah. like so fucking gorgeous. Um, but so, yeah, this, uh, this story kind of takes us back there. So, so this takes place in Chicago? Ah, uh, yes. Um, and so... Kind of. Okay. You, you will okay. see. Okay. I, okay. I don't want to. Okay. okay. Uh, now, do you remember in the in the story of H.H. H. Holmes or the case, mm -hmm. do you remember Howard uh, Pizel? It was oh, his henchman. Yes, yes. Yes. His like Igor type. Yes. His yeah, evil dude. henchman. And, and for those of you who are like, you know, looking for whatever more content or curious about this particular topic, yeah. Dan did cover H.H. Yeah, uh, H. Holmes. Early episode of Time Suck. Yeah. Episode 25 back in March of 2017. Wow. If you if you want that whole story. But just for people who don't know. uh about Howard Pizel 
Specifically, he was the son of Benjamin and Carrie Pizel, and Howard and his siblings Alice and Nellie were abducted and eventually killed by Herman Mudgett, a.k.a. H.H. H. Holmes, yeah. in 1894. Uh, and this was only months after Mudgett murdered their father. And oh my God. It, it was like this whole fucking crazy thing where H.H. H. Holmes and um, uh, Benjamin Pizel had this scam. Right. And the life insurance scam. And mm-hmm. they were going to, you know, do a fraudulent life insurance ca- uh, claim. And little did Benjamin Pizel know that H.H. H. Holmes planned on killing him and then killed his whole fucking family. Right. No witnesses kind right. of thing. He, he was very good at very, doing very bad things for a long time. Oh, my yeah. God. So crazy. OK. So that's sort of yeah. a little background information to help this all come together. OK. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. My name is Chad. I've been a fan of Dan's comedy for a few years now. I just recently discovered Thank Scared you. to Death from a Pandora commercial. I was immediately hooked, and in the interest of keeping this email from turning into a novel, I'll try to keep this as short as I can. For a bit of personal background, I've always been interested in ghosts and the paranormal. I personally have had my fair share of experiences in my life. But today, I'd like to tell you about the house I live in right now. First and foremost, I live in Indianapolis, Indiana, in a neighborhood called Irvington. Mm -hmm. Irvington boasts as being the most haunted neighborhood in the Midwest and has a couple books even written about it. Every Halloween, there is a big street festival with small events running the whole week leading up to it. It's a hugely popular event and has drawn upwards of 50,000 people for the main day festival. For the entire month of October, there are walking tours of all the haunted sites in the neighborhood, which brings me to my house. And no, my house is not on the tour. My neighbor's house, on the other hand, is. What makes the house special for the tour is the property's connection to H.H. Holmes. Now, I know Dan did a whole time suck on H.H. Holmes, so I won't go into that backstory. But my property and my next door neighbor and the house behind us are all part of the original property where the remains of Howard Pizel were found. Like I said, the house next door is on the tour, but is not the original house. The original house was actually moved to another lot less than 50 yards away. Oh, wow. So now that you've got the backstory, it's time for the spooky stuff. In 2009, my family moved into our first home. The house was built in 1910 and at one point was split into an upstairs and downstairs apartment. It was a fixer-upper and sometimes I feel like the work will never end. When we moved in, we did not know any of the history of the neighborhood or the property. And yes, I can already hear you both with your oh no comments. <laughs> we did find out from my cousin who lived at lived next door at the time about the history not long after moving in. Which, like, shame on your cousin for not telling you ahead of time. <laughs> the first thing we noticed were random sounds in the house. Now, I've already said, I love the paranormal and I'm definitely a creeper. But I'm, ol- but I'm also the type of person who will look for logical explanations mm-hmm. first. So when the weird creaks and bumps in the days and the nights randomly started, I wrote it off as a 100-year-old house with hardwood floors making 100-year-old house sounds. Things changed when my wife's friend came to visit. I was downstairs, and my wife was showing her friend around the house. Side note here, my son, who was about five years old at the time, was at my mom's house for the evening. When they came back downstairs, my wife's friend asked me where my son was. I said he was at his grandma's, to which she said, Huh. I thought I saw him upstairs in your office. Weird. She swore and still swears to this day she saw a boy she thought was our son in my office upstairs. Fast forward a couple years, with random footsteps happening occasionally, my son talking to his toys or an imaginary friend, after knowing the history of the property and the neighborhood, we accepted that, yes, we live in a haunted house. My wife and I were sitting on opposite ends of the couch and she was eating starbursts. Whenever she eats a Starburst, she folds the wrappers into tiny little squares and piles them up on the arm of the chair. I only tell you this adorable little habit of hers because as we were sitting there, out of the corner of my eye, I saw one of the wrappers fly up and hit her in the head. She immediately immediately looked at me and asked if I threw it at her. When I told her no, of course she didn't believe me. It may have been because I was laughing so hard knowing what had actually happened and knowing I'd be blamed for it. (laughs) She did start to believe me when I pointed out that we were on opposite ends of the couch and I hadn't eaten any Starburst to have any wrappers to throw at her. Uh Another incident involving another friend of ours. We had a few friends over for drinks and a general fun night with good people, which is what I miss most during the COVID world. This one friend crashed on her couch and the next morning when I came downstairs, he asked if I had been down earlier. I said no, I had just woken up. Apparently, while he was asleep on the couch, he heard someone say, you can get up now. 
What? And as he started to open his hot, his eyes, he saw someone walk around the corner to the bathroom. He had assumed it was me and went out for a smoke on the front porch, expecting me to join him when I came out of the restroom. But when I never did, he presumed I had gone back upstairs to bed. At least until I did wake up and told him I had not yet been downstairs. <laughs> on another night, when my wife and I were going to bed, she said, Did you say something? I told her no, and she slept a bit closer to me that night. The next morning when we woke up, I told her I had totally heard what she heard. We both thought we heard a voice say something either like there or where. She said she heard it from my side of the bed, and I thought it came from her side of the bed. Both of us got a chill realizing it must have been between us. Over the years, we've had other friends have other experiences. At one time, we had a friend living with us using my old office as her bedroom. She said the door would pop open or it would feel like someone was pulling on her blankets by her feet at night. I told her if it keeps her up to just say, Howard, stop it. I'm trying to sleep <laughs> in reference to Howard Pizel. Uh -huh. This usually worked and she would be left alone for weeks unless things were in a more active time. We have also had a couple of trusted friends house it and take care of our pets when we've got out of town. And there's never a shortage of reports of footsteps or bumps in the night, but nothing malicious or negative has ever happened. There was something on the shower, though, uh, on the shower steamed mirror, though, and I've attached a picture of that, too. Overall, voices and moving objects are pretty rare. The house seems to have a cycle of quiet and then more active times. Because of the playful nature of things, I'm fairly convinced there's a good possibility it's Howard Pizel. I hope you enjoyed my story. Thanks for reading, Chad. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Crazy, huh? I mean, mm -hmm. like, cool. Like, you know, yeah. like, not super spoopy, but, like, just, right. I think, a very interesting story. Oh, yeah. And so we have uh, five pictures to go along with this story. So okay. the, the first photo that we have is uh, a picture of an Irvington Haunts book. Oh, okay, cool. Book, and it's called Irvington Haunts, The Tour Guide by Alan E. Hunter. Mm -hmm. So if you're curious to check out the area, you live there. And then also another book by the same title, Irvington Haunts, um, just Irvington Haunts by... Simnick, Simnick and Simnick Hunter. Simnick and Hunter. Simnick and Hunter. And then just, you know, cool. for for uh, some confirmation that his house is where he says it is and all of that, yeah. we have a, an article um, about Howard Pizel uh, confirming geez. his death uh, on August 28th, 1895. The article headline is Pizel, Trunk and Bones. And then it goes on to say the discoveries that were made in Irvington. And then, you know, there's a picture of Howard Pizel. Yeah. And and further confirmation is mm -hmm. in this next photo in this article they had shown pictures of little Howard's Ugh. teeth. Poor poor guy. I know, poor little kid. What a mm -hmm. sad sad ending. And then you know in Chad's story he referenced in his house yeah. at some point um there was a steamy mirror shower situation right, and something right. showed up on the mirror and so um he took a picture of that uh and here is that photo. Here come the spoons. <laughs> <laughs> That's for, for anyone confused right now. That is a uh, little callback to um, a stand-up bit of mine from uh, the Hear This album. Yeah, a, a, nice Chad. A very old bit. Noise. I know it's good. Noise. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So yeah, great stories. That, this those week. are great stories. I know. I I looked at the clock. We did such a, a big episode. I think it's our biggest <laughs> non-bonus episode. Well, there you go. And if you're a lot of spooks, listen. If you were curious about becoming an Annabelle or a Robert, mm -hmm. that's what bonus episodes look like. They're they're big, the, the fat, big ones. meaty, juicy yumminess. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess I guess that's that's the uh, that's it end of our show. Except for some thank yous for some oh, Annabelles. Yeah, oh my goodness! I want to skip to the thank yous. What? How could I? You have, I know you have ahead, some. Do you want to start? Uh, I'll start, and I know you have some special birthday things and stuff too. Of course, I do. Uh, I want to thank our our Annabelle patrons, uh, Ty DeLacy. Alyssa Bergman, Ryan Lawrence, Lena, uh, no last name included, Jeremy Dabney, Shadow Devereaux. Uh, Great that, name. That, I know, that's not, I, I thought of like a horror author. I know, I was like, well, I love your name. Uh, James Bakersville, and Ryan uh, Ryan Story, Anna Tofoya, and Melissa Swigert. Do you like that I gave you all easy names this week? You did. You're you welcome. really did. You're welcome. I would like to thank Annabelle's Brock Daly. Julie and Jason McCraw down in Nashville. Love you guys. I remember them from many stand-up shows. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Curie, Lib the Zilla, Jake <laughs> Adam, Kimberly Finky, Kyle Bigham, Hannah Jo Rush, Angel Blackburn, and Jesse Arp, who happens to be mm -hmm. Kyler's former seventh oh, grade English teacher. Yes, uh, very cool. I, know, I love very seeing her cool. name. Oh, so I love seeing her name too. I know. And then I have some quick spooby shout outs. Uh, now, Dan, you're going to help out with one of these. Okay. 
Okay, yep. so we have a birthday shout out to Josh mm-hmm. from Chris, but uh, Josh's favorite character from Time Suck mm-hmm. is our friend Woody. Happy birthday! Ha, ha, wee! I hope that all of the scared to death people who don't listen to Time Suck are just sitting so there going, confused. what the fuck? <laughs> Why is Woody here? Oh my god, I will go no further with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, spooky shout out to Carrie from your daughter Sierra. Happy birthday to Laura from Haley. Happy birthday, bestie. To Rock Jesus from your daughter Katrina. Happy belated birthday. To Becky from your sister Patera, happy mm-hmm. birthday. And to Rindy from Robert, I love you. What's, what's I, what? I love you too. <laughs> Bunny. <laughs> I love this little doll. <laughs> Sometimes we have to bring in Baby Secret. Mm-hmm. She's girlfriend. appropriate for this show. She is. She is. <laughs> So and that's it. That's that's Do you want me it. To hold Woody for you. you no, know, I'm gonna I'm gonna Woody and I. This, we're just gonna oh keep it weird for the end of the for the end of the show. You guys, I'm so sorry if you don't know what's going on. So, this is a character from Time Suck. So Woody got brought in. He hasn't been on Time Suck for a while. And that's all for today. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, you can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can send alcohol and maybe painkillers to an address. <laughs> I'll put in the show notes. Thank you to Logan and uh, Kate for social media, badmagicmerch.com, a merch design store at badmagicproductions.com for customer service, producer Sophie Evans for help with story curation, Joe Paisley for producing and directing, Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation, uh, Hella Rylander for organizing the My Store emails. Uh, thank you to Spotify for the, the, the placement. It really helps us. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on, on YouTube if you don't mind. Follow us on Facebook and IG, as the kids call it, the Scared to Death Podcast. We have a private <laughs> Facebook group, Creeps and Papers. Uh, 12,000 members for horror lovers. Don't post uh, nudes. You can send those to an uh, address I'll provide later. If if <laughs> You don't want more ads if you want bonus episodes. Check out Patreon and get some more blah, blah, blah. I don't give a shit. I don't get that money. Enjoy your nightmares, crazy papers. I'm just scared to death. Wee! If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death.